great. So welcome everybody to a session that we're sharing today with the Saltag uh, movement. And we have a presentation from JISC's um, Alistair uh, McNaught, who's joining us as well. And uh, we're going to just start off the session, which is provocatively titled Promises and Lies. And uh, aims to uh, get us thinking about how inclusive OERs are and how inclusive we are in our digital practice uh, and challenges, challenges, challenges us to uh, think about that. Uh, and I think we're going to have some really interesting discussions arising from that. So I'm very grateful to um, Peter and to Alistair for joining us today. Uh, my name is Theresa McKinnon. I'm at the University of Warwick and I'm chair of the Open Ed SIG. And uh, today what we're going to do is just start off, first of all, with moving us through the um, the platform just to make sure everybody's familiar. So as I mentioned, we have two presenters joining us. Peter Kilcoyne on behalf of Haltag from the heart of Worcestershire College. And Alistair McNaught from JISC, who's a subject specialist uh, and, uh, and a, a brilliant writer of haiku, I have to say, as well. So if you haven't yet discovered Alistair on Twitter, you, you have to because his poetry lightens, brightens my life every day. It's excellent. Um, so welcome. You've already run through the, uh, the tools, so you know your way around a little bit. Hopefully you've run your audio setup and you're hearing us okay. If not, at the bottom left, you can see there's a little moderators tab. So if you've got any technical problems, just click, click on the moderators tab in the chat box and send us a message and we will try and help and make sure that you can hear us and we can deal with any problems. Um, there's a, just a quick reminder of uh, the chat panel as well. During the session, if you have any questions, what we'd like you to do is to just pop them into the chat. If you can prefix them with a Q, that will help me uh, find them and pose them to our uh, presenters as well later. So that would be really helpful. And do feel free, obviously, to discuss things as they as you come across them and to use that chat um, to exchange perhaps links or ideas. Um, the Open Ed uh, SIG, so OE SIG or the Open Ed SIG Special Interest Group, uh, there's a little bit about us there. Uh, and our remit is very clear. We want to support, develop, sustain, and influence policy in open education. And o by open education, we mean removing or reducing the barriers to access to learning uh, wherever we find them. And we know there are many, and we know it's complicated. Um, but we also look as well, um, increasingly as a SIG, at joining up the discussions around open in lots of other fields too. And there'll be more about that uh, towards the end of the session today. So I'm going to pass over now to Peter to tell you a little bit about Feltag, having spoken briefly about the Open Ed SIG. OK, thank you, Teresa. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, from uh, a very sunny Worcester. I um, hope you're all hearing me OK. Uh, yes, my role today as a member of the Alt Celtag SIG is just to do a, a brief overview of Celtag, um, particularly for those of you that aren't from the further education sector. Um, Celtag stands for the Further Education Learning Technology Action Group. Uh, and it was a group uh, put together um, to produce a report for the government um, in 2013, um, uh, made up of the various great and the good from further education and the learning technology world. Um, and it had a number of work streams, um, horizon scanning, investment capital infrastructure, uh, regulation and funding, capacity and capability of providers, employers and learners, um, which it <coughs> gave an overview of where the situation was at the time and uh, made a number of um, recommendations as to how these different things could be moved forward for, for the sector. Um, if any of you haven't read the report, if you just Google Celtag, um, it's very easy to find and, and download. Um, now, what happened with Teltag has been very interesting. Um, 
the recommendations were given to the government, the uh, education minister made replies, which many of us felt were, were very disappointing and uh, didn't really respond to a lot of the recommendations that were made. And we're going back now, three governments worth, as it were. We, we're talking about the, the uh, Liberal, um, Democrat, Conservative coalition government. So clearly that's ancient history now. Um, so at the government level, the report kind of, yeah, somebody remembers Tim vaguely. Um, the report kind of died, but what's been very interesting about Feltag is that the sector really took ownership of it. And um, Bob Harrison, who was, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, um, who's a, a great proponent of the sector and learning technology, and um, speaks at many um, learning technology events, and is a very vocal tweeter, and if you don't follow Bob, I couldn't recommend his tweets high enough to follow. He's sort of coined this phrase of um, Feltag being a movement, not a report, and Bob often talks about the spirit of Feltag, and I think that is very true, that it is something that the, the sector and um, supporting organisations like JISC and ALT have really taken ownership of themselves and have driven forward a lot of the ideas that came from Feltag, which have now become mainstreamed um, in the sector. Um, and so, yeah, it still echoes down the line, and um, this um, webinar is linked to some of that, and, and Alistair is talking about a number of issues regarding um, the accessibility of um, open content, and this very much fits in with the capacity and capability of providers and uh, the learners' agendas. So I'll now uh, pass on to Alistair, who will take it from here. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just check in the text chat pane that people can hear? Just a quick yes will be great. That sounds good. Well, a couple of people can hear. Lovely. Okay, the promise, digital diversity. I love the concept of open educational resources, um, and I love the way it can help meet more needs for more learners with less work for staff. And uh, this diagram here, I'll just talk you through this diagram. This became very clear to me many years ago, back in the late 1990s, when we were um, actively developing an intranet at the college where I taught. <coughs> I began to realize that different members of staff produced very different kind of content. So for example, my content, um, I used quite a lot of text, I used a fair few images, but mainly to illustrate the points in the text. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a video camera back in those days. A video camera was a thing you had to go and purchase independently. It wasn't on your phone. Um, so I didn't use much in the way of video or audio. I did do quite a lot of interactivity, just using Word documents, drag and drop with text boxes, pop-up screen tips, and so on. So that was my profile. But what I realized was that my colleague uh, Jan, for example, her content was very, very different to mine. <clears throat> she wasn't a very texty person. Uh, she used quite a lot of images, and she was very keen on, on recording audio clips. My colleague Kim, on the other hand, um, had a completely different approach at all uh, to, from that completely. My colleague Steve was somebody who his, his content was uh, very strongly mind map based. He liked sketching mind maps on pieces of paper, but we could scan that, load it up onto the, uh, onto the virtual learning environment uh, or the intranet as our learning platform was at that time. What it meant was because all of us shared all our resources with all our students, it meant that a student that was in my class, which was a mainly textual class, but really benefited from audio, could just nip over and see what Jan was doing in her class um, on the intranet. So students were going between the different resources. Now, of course, open educational resources, the whole open educational content movement, gives us tremendous opportunities to be able to not just have four or five different kind of rainbows of 
teaching styles and teaching preferences, but potentially millions of resources where I could give students videos from the Khan Academy and I could give student access to academic texts from core.ac.uk. And I can mix and match according to my particular students' needs, their particular levels, their preferred medium. We have a rainbow of digital diversity. And for those of you that remember your basic physics, I've even tried to get the color sequence right from the top to the bottom. So what we should be able to do with an open educational um, movement, we ought to be able to allow our students to move freely across these rainbows, picking out the kinds of resources that best meet their needs, that are best adapted to their assistive technologies. However, there's a difference between theory and practice, because I'm going to, uh, I think Theresa used the word provocative, I'm going to make some provocative comments because I think the open educational resource movement is plagued by five digital deceptions. These are things that look like they're one thing but are actually something else and they all boil down to a lack of awareness of basic accessibility practice, basic inclusion good practices. They have impacts for all users, not just for disabled users, but their impact is particularly marked, particularly noticeable for people with additional support needs. So let's have a look at the digital deceptions. Now remember, we're starting with a rainbow of diversity that looks like this. As we work through the next 20 minutes, our rainbow is going to be decidedly monochrome. So the first digital deception is text that isn't. Text that pretends to be text, I can see a PDF document on the screen, and yet it's not text, it's just an image of text, so my tools uh, simply won't work with it. My text-to-speech tool that I might need won't work with it. Somebody that wants to magnify the text but not have to scroll left and right off the screen to see it um, won't be able to do that because there's no way a picture of text can reflow. So what we see here is her content, her text content that I thought was a great supplement to mine isn't. His content, again, scanned images with no... OCR, no optical character recognition taking place, um, that isn't. So that first deception text that is just an image of text has lost me some of my digital diversity. And it doesn't end there. But let's just have a look at why this might matter. Um, I've talked, I talked briefly there about a couple of issues. Um, but I want you to spend a few minutes thinking about scanned documents on your virtual learning environment, scanned documents in an ebook platform that you subscribe to, scanned documents in a repository of information that you use that you thought was an open educational repository, but you find lots of scanned documents. Okay, now there are disbenefits for all kinds of users, disabled users, non-disabled users. Can we see? So we've got the first thing. Teresa said screen readers can't use them. Yep, excellent. Joe is saying can't cut and paste into something. Of course, really significant thing. You can't cut out a quote. You have to type it manually. <clears throat> screen readers can't read. Again, we've got that whole thing about screen readers. And of course, not just screen readers, because screen reader users are a very small proportion of the demographic. So you'd have to be completely blind to be a screen reader user. But people who benefit from text-to-speech, that's a much bigger um, demographic. So, for example, people with dyslexia, that's roughly speaking, we reckon, about 10% of the population. People whose perhaps English is a second or third language, um, and they're used to reading a script that goes from right to left instead of left to right, for them, listening to text is very often a much, much more effective way of uh, consuming information than it is to read it off the screen because listening to it is something that they've done for years, listening to English language TVs, films, um, audio, pop songs and so on. So background colour and contrast, excellent one. Yes, you can't change the background colour and contrast. If it was a PDF document that 
Now, it has actual words on an actual background. You can change those colors. Difficult to resize the text. The image quality, of course, once you get to maybe 100% um, magnification, maybe you're, you're getting really fuzzy um, fonts, whereas if it was real text, uh, it would, you know, the fonts would be vector-based and they would um, improve. Time to load, that could be an issue. An image is much bigger uh, as well. Yeah. You can get your tablet to read PDF aloud. Well, you may be able to if it's a PDF that isn't just an image scan. And the other thing to bear in mind, Joe, is that um, sometimes, uh, again, it will depend on the, the nature of the PDF, but you can get a PDF which is an image scan. And this happens on Google quite a lot, on the Google Scholar sites. It's an image scan. But underneath it, for screen reader users, they, they have almost like a hidden text layer that only screen readers can get to. But that's very much the exception rather than the rule. So we've got loads of really good things there, even, even the, <coughs> the potential problems of books on scanners losing parts of a page, uh, the physical impact of scanning texts. The key thing here is that what is really important for you to think about and really important for us to try to influence upstream through any, uh, any ways you have of influencing open educational practice in your organization is make sure that open educational practice adheres to basic good practice in accessibility. Because if it doesn't, it's a deception. You're not really providing the quality and range of material that you could be providing. You're putting barriers there that needn't be there. Now, the, the second deception is <coughs> what I call structure that isn't. And th this is the sort of thing where you look at a document and it looks fantastic in terms of how well structured and laid out it is. So you can see the main heading, you can see the chapter heading, you can then see a section heading, and then you can see subsections underneath that, and even subsections under the subsections. And you look at it on screen, on the print, and it looks brilliant. You think that is so easy to navigate, it's so clear to see where I am on the screen, on the page. The problem is, of course, most documents are not a single screen on a page. Most documents might go, you know, a book, for example, might be 600 pages long. Now, depending on how you create your document, if you create your document by um, selecting a heading and then clicking the style headings, heading one, heading two, heading three, then that document will be not only fantastic to look at on the page, but it will be fantastic to access digitally. So a Word document that's been well structured, maybe 400 pages long. I remember working with a, a friend's PhD thesis. He had 400 pages of Word document, and he had headings all over it, you know, but he hadn't used the inbuilt styles. Consequently, when you try to look at the navigation pane or the outline view, there was absolutely nothing to see. And he was spending hours and hours trying to move sections around when he realized that a section might fit better in a new section he's just written. And moving them around, trying to work out what was where and what page. We went through it, and in a very short time, because he had been consistent in the types of headings he'd used, very quickly we'd been able to assign heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, heading five. Instantly, we could then see the whole interactive telescopic structure in the navigation pane. There are simple tools, plugins for web pages that will do exactly the same. Headings map for Google Chrome is an excellent example. If you've got a really long web page, uh, just click on headings map for Google Chrome, and it will show you main headings for subheadings. It works fantastically if the author has created the document using those heading styles. If they haven't, if they've just selected the text and said bold, 20 point, um, underlined, then there will be no way you can get that valuable navigational information. So what that's done in this example here, so I've lost some more content because um, 
it might be that my content, for example, whilst I've got loads of text content, if I didn't know about those headings, those structural headings, and nobody told me that that was the way I should do it, and nobody told me that the reason why I should do it that way is because of the fantastic navigation it gives to every single user, which is particularly important to users with print impairment, then maybe I didn't use heading stars at all. So suddenly we find not only has her content and his content proved to be a deception, but my content's proved to be a deception as well. So what I'd, what I'd just ask for a few minutes now is, do you routinely use heading styles to structure your documents? A yes, a no. If you do, just tell me why. Is it because of this, or is it because somebody told you to, or is it because it's just you saw it there, it seemed good good idea at the time? If you don't, maybe why not? So let's see. So Therese has just, used, uh, Therese has just recently begun to use them. <clears throat> the accessibility aspect is phenomenally important, Therese. So well done for starting to use them, but uh, if you, you know, if you look at a well-structured document and you click on View Zoom Document Map, what a difference that makes for somebody trying to read through. Uh, word styles needed to generate APA tables content. Yes, good point. So th this is a wonderful kind of honesty thing. Some people say I do it a bit and I do it sometimes. The other big advantage, if you do it, a lot of people create first in Word and then export to HTML or, or PDF. If you use the inbuilt styles, they export to whatever else you export to. So it's do it once, use it many times. Um, Elizabeth's making the point there about it looks good, and Joe's making the point that it looks ugly. The, the thing that joins those two together is that if you've been consistent in your use of styles, you can make a style look however you want. So you can just use the default style that's there, and when you finish the document, or even before you finish the document, click on over heading one, for example, right click over it, and you can change it to look exactly as you want. I've got two documents. One, uh, in fact, the one that you see on the screen, background to hair, I've got a version of that as I got it from a tutor. Um, and then I've got a second version I made. The tutor had, hadn't known about using style, so she had used you know, just the normal bold, italic font size, etc. I created something that looked absolutely identical on print. You can't tell the difference. If I put two copies in front of you, you cannot tell the difference. As soon as you go online with them, you look at hers, you click on the navigation pane, and there is nothing. You've got a seven-page document, no way of navigating through it quickly. You look on my version of it, which is identical when printed out, and my version you know, it shows you all the heading ones, all the heading twos. You can skip in three clicks. You can skip to any part of the document. So, <coughs> ah, Scrivener. I won't comment on Scrivener, Jeff. I did try Scrivener, and I got so confused and lost so much work that I gave up. I don't think that was a, a Scrivener problem. I think that was a user problem. But um, the, the key thing is, wherever you can use them, use them. Um, they're really important. And they generally will translate well. I know a few of you are saying there there's some problems, but um, what's interesting, I noticed Leo saying that you can go between Word and Google Docs as well. Uh, right, OK, so thank you very much for that. Let's look at the third deception. There's only five, so we, we're doing fine for time. You might even get an extra dinner. Um, and here I've provocatively call this rich media that impoverish. So it's media and interaction. So it could be an interactivity, or it could be video, it could be audio. But something that is designed to make students engaged, something that's designed to make students think, oh, that's great. Oh, that's so much better way of learning than trying to read from this dry, dusty textbook. And yet, when they get there, there are significant problems, because the thing about audio and video is that they can be, in some ways, for some students, they can be easier to access information for. Um, but what about if you've got an hour-long lecture? And I'm wanting to revise my hour-long lecture. And the thing I want to revise is I want to know what it was that Vygotsky said 
about social constructivism or something. Now I've got two problems. If, I've, if I'm trying to do this entirely from a, a video recording, I'm thinking to myself, there was this guy called Vygotsky. The problem is I want to quote him and I have no idea how you spell his name because it doesn't tell me in the video. There's just a tutor talking about Vygotsky. So I can't search for key words. Neither can I search for, two, for key dates. So a tutor says about something that happened in 1915. And I'm not quite sure if they said 1950 or 1915. To be able to just skim some text for that would be really helpful. And to be able to look at an hour long video and not think, uh, I think the Vygotsky bit was somewhere in the middle. To be able to go to something that's text and just search in social constructivism. Instantly, I would find, ah, that's how you spell Vygotsky. I found it. And you'd instantly find your, um, the reference you wanted. Now, what I'm not saying is that every video you do and every audio you do should have a full transcript or um, subtitling. Now, you may feel that that is a surprising thing for an accessibility advocate to be saying, that you, know, you don't have to produce the full transcript all the time. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because rich media is better than just no te sorry just no media at all. So if I've got a choice between a member of staff who only uploads text and a member of staff who uses text and audio and video, the one that's going to be most inclusive is the one that uses the bigger variety of media. However, what I'm also not saying is that if I'm going to encourage people to start using media, I cannot afford to put them off by saying every little bit of video you create has to have subtitling on it, and that's going to take you an extra hour. I'm not going to say that to members of staff who are busy teaching. I will say that to the e-learning developer whose full-time job it is to, to work with video software and to be competent and confident and fast at doing subtitling, but I'm not going to say it to a, a teacher. What I'll say to a teacher is, as a minimum, give me the, the key teaching points that are in that video. And that might be the name. It might be Vygotsky, and it might be a date, and it might be the name of a theory, and it might be a couple of other people. Equally, it might be a transcript. If you, you know, if it's a video of yourself, or if you've done your own podcast, then it makes perfect sense. If you're doing a podcast, you, you do a script to get you going anyway. The script can be the transcript. The point is, what I want is some text alternative that will give me what the key teaching objectives are. And that will not just benefit dyslexic students, or print impaired students, or deaf students. It will benefit everybody. So let's have a look now. Let's get you doing some work. Oh, the zone of proximal development, exactly. That is exactly the point. It's about taking people where they are and moving them to the next point, not moving them, you know, asking them to move so far beyond that they're just not going to engage at all. So what about you? What are you going to do here? What I'm interested in is is the guidance in your organization for the accessible use of multimedia and interactivities? Is it something that people have even thought about? Have you got a draconian um, regime where you know, something has to be checked by three people, and if it hasn't got scene description and subtitling, you can't load it, even though it's something that took you five minutes to create to show how a maybe a little lab experiment takes place, five minutes to create, and then five hours to do subtitling and scene description. You know, that doesn't sound to me like an effective way of encouraging people to get online. But tell me your experiences. That's what I'd like to know. What are your experiences? Teresa, <coughs> open standards, so that's a, yeah, slightly different. But let me just, uh, I'm, uh, you keep typing things in. I'll just go back. I think I've missed something there. Yeah, the YouTube subtitles, that's a really good system to use, Anne Catherine. And I completely agree with you. They will always need some editing. But if you only have 20% editing to do instead of 100% editing, that's taken you a lot further.
So Boat Beck's got some light touch guidance, and I think that's the right kind of guidance to have, to have light touch guidance for it to become something that that is a, almost a, um, a quality mark, something that people do because it's good practice, because um, having that summary of what the teaching points are actually makes you think about why you did it in the first place, what value added you've got by putting it there. Uh, Daniel, no particular guidance there. I think it's something where it's worth having guidance. And remember what I said about guidance needs to be appropriate to the people you're guiding. So I don't think, I'm definitely not talking about um, a get out of jail card free for e-learning developers so they can just throw stuff up online without thinking about um, whether or not subtitling is important, whether or not full transcripts are important. Generally speaking, you should go for as high an accessibility as you can, but that has to be proportionate to the skills that that person is expected to have. Oh, you've got the link there, thanks, Leo, that's great. Kirsty, that's a really important point. I think the, the flipped classroom is great. There are all kinds of benefits with it. But if it's not done with a recognition of accessibility, then you end up flipping the classroom, making a better experience for quite a lot of people, and then actually a worse experience for other people. And I think one of the key things here is that if you take the argument about subtitling, um, kind of key point summaries, transcripts, etc., if you take the argument that it's only about deaf people or only about blind people, then a lot of teachers say, well, I haven't got any deaf students, I haven't got any blind students, so I'll not bother. The really important thing is to show, like that Vygotsky example earlier, to show that this adds significant value for everyone. There are many times I've watched a video um, especially a, one of those talking head videos where you have a lecturer talking about something. But many times I've watched something and at the end of it I thought there was a lot in there but I'm not exactly sure what the key points were. And I would love to have been able to look at the transcript and just read through it again or I would have loved even more perhaps for there to be a summary. You know, the key takeaways from this are X, Y and Z. And Joe, that's a really important point as well. I also hate watching videos. I have to do regular training because I'm a home-based worker. I can't do the normal office fire drill, manual handling, etc. So they send me online ones and they're all video. And I switch off the video every single slide and I read the transcript because it's 10 times faster for me and I get it. Um, so you know, some people really love watching videos. Some people, like me and Joe, hate watching videos. And it's important that we recognize that, that diversity. We're supposed to be adding value for all, not adding it for some and taking it away from others. Daniel, that's a really interesting one. There's, there's plenty of things to discuss in this. And I think the big issue about this is giving people choices. So always including audio is not always sensible. Especially if, you're, uh, if the content that you're looking at is accessible to text-to-speech tools. There are free plugins. Uh, there's Google Reader, which works brilliantly in Chrome. Select the text on the browser page, and it will read to you. So I don't need somebody to produce audio necessarily. Um, <clears throat> oh, thank you, Leo. I'm the, the second time I've needed to blush today. Um, and we've got future loan court, didn't watch the videos but read the transcripts. It's exactly the same point, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, interesting though, Teresa's point about listening to video in the background while I do other things. And again, I'm, I'm a real fan of radio, real fan of podcasts, uh, because I can do other things as well. And so it's horses for courses. And sometimes, in terms of revision, for example, if I didn't have access to audio, if I didn't have access to some of the things that I download and listen to, I simply wouldn't get to them because I wouldn't have enough time. But if I'm taking the dog a walk or I'm going on a long journey, it's a perfect opportunity. So um, it's being able to add value wherever possible and minimize the reduction of value to other people. 
So, we're on to the last two now, and I'm going to do two of these together and then leave a final couple of slides for discussion. What you'll notice, however, is that our beautiful rainbow of diversity uh, is decidedly less colourful than it was. It is sad, isn't it, Theresa? So, here we've got non-reusable content. This really annoys me sometimes. Um, it used to be a big problem with some of the kind of well-known repositories. So you would have, you would go to Joram when Joram existed, and you'd find in there some really nice examples of an interactive thing. It was maybe created on Flash, or maybe it was Articulate Storyline or something, and it looks great. But the only thing is, you look at slide five, and slide five, they use terms that we don't use, terms that are just not relevant to, to how I would use that. I used to teach Earth Science, I think I might have mentioned that, I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of statistics in, you know, in geography, a lot of statistics in bio, oh sorry, ecosystems, biogeography and so on. If I found a fantastic economic statistics package, I would love to use it. But what I would want to do is just go in there and slide five where it talks about sampling in the context of one thing. I would want to change that and make that relevant to, to what my students are doing. That's what an open educational resource should allow you to do. But so often I found that I couldn't do it because either I needed a very expensive proprietary bit of software or I found that the the assets in that software weren't available separately. It, it would have been kind of okay if I'd had the text available in one place or a separate text file, a separate image file. That's a really big argument for, um, where possible, making sure that the tools you use allow disaggregation so that somebody could just take that graph out, right click over the graph and save it, that they can take the text, copy it and paste it somewhere else. So often I've used educational resources, open educational resources, where I simply couldn't do that and that's been really annoying. Um, using open source tools solves the problem to a certain extent, so anything that you create in Xerti, for example, um, you can give somebody that whole bundle of content and it will run as a Xerti object, but equally if I just wanted to look at the images in there, in the bundle, the zip file I've had, I've got all the images, I've got all the audio, I've got everything that I need in the media folder. Equally if I have my own installation I can just import it straight away, edit it, change the pages I might or might not have. So that was one of the issues, the non-reusable content. It looks open, but because I can't reuse it, it's not really as open and useful as it could be. And the last one that I want to look at is where you just don't know. You've got some content out there that you found and you just cannot find any information about its copyright status. So this is deception five. I don't know. I think it's open, but I'm not quite sure. And so the last, you notice if I go back to that last slide, we just had a couple of things, a bit of audio, a bit of interactivity, a couple of images that were left and maybe a little bit of content over there. But when I finally get to those materials that I can use with any student I have, I then get to those resources and I look at them and there's no statement, there's no kind of creative commons, there's no you know, this resource can be reused under these licensing conditions. And so I think, ah, I'm not sure. Actually, I'll be completely truthful, as a teacher, I completely ignored that anyway, and I was using all kinds of material because teachers do that. We uh, are inclined to um, treat copyright more lightly than we should. But the reality is, if you're being a being a good, responsible teacher, tutor, if you're a quality assurance manager, you want to make sure you know exactly what you can do. So, here we are, final questions then, reclaiming the opportunities. What can we do to reclaim those promises? We said there are five digital deceptions that undermine those promises of digital diversity. So it might be to do with specifying good practice, it might be saying, look, there's a threshold requirement here, you can upload stuff into the repository or you can put a kind of license on it provided it meets these requirements. Maybe it's to do with metadata, maybe it's to do with what I call hierarchy of preferred formats where you, you, know, you say, really, 
the best format is Word, structured Word document, or maybe the best format is EPUB, or maybe the best format is HTML because it's nice and non-proprietary, and you start specifying things like that. But I'm, I don't know. I'm asking the question. So can we see what you think in the text chat pane? I'll have a read at the other things that have been going in. I'm sure Teresa will help me if there's particular questions I've missed. Yes, there's lots of it's lots of very lively contributions, which is great to see, Alistair. It's been a really, really, yeah. really well appreciated session. Um, Catherine uh, and Catherine makes a, a really interesting point there about people taking them out of context. I think. <laughs> That could potentially be used, though, in terms of the um, Creative Commons copywriting. You, know, you could say no derivatives, I guess, and, and then make that yeah. distinction between things that you do, that you are happy for people to reuse, and things that you aren't happy. But I, I do take the point. That's a very fair point. EPUB, just like EPUB, yeah, EPUB's particularly good on uh, tablet devices and mobile phones and the like. I think increasingly we're going to see EPUB as a um, as a format of choice because the EPUB standard has got accessibility in its heart. Uh, that doesn't necessarily guarantee it will be used well, but it means that you have to work quite hard to create bad content, uh, particularly with EPUB 3. EPUB 3 is really accessible. Yes, increasing that understanding of, of Creative Commons licensing as well isn't that important. And uh, you know, I'm not sure how many institutions actually run support sessions um, to give people the opportunity to discuss uh, things like Creative Commons licensing. Um, but we we do have to be much more aware as as professionals these days of um, the, the whole business of ownership. Uh, and creation uh, online. Yes, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, I think making people aware, helping to educate people is clearly something that has a lot of benefit because if they understand how to um, attribute their own resources, then it, it helps them understand how they could use others. And certainly for me, it's been personally been really helpful for me to kind of begin to get my head around that. But I do appreciate it's not something that you know that's high in the priority of any teachers. Um, I was looking um, look at the point there Jeffrey's making about looking for open resources to support mentoring, but not found very many. I must admit there's been a number of occasions where I've been looking for open resources, and um, you know, sometimes you, I almost have to set myself a time limit where I say, I'm going to look for educational resources for an hour, for other people's resources for an hour. If after that time I haven't found any, I'm going to make it because otherwise I could spend, I could end up spending more time looking for something that doesn't quite do the job than creating it from scratch. So I think sometimes there's a pragmatic balance to come in there. Joe, I'm sure your materials, Joe J, I'm sure your materials are really great. But I do I do take the point that quite often quite often you find that the people that are less confident about their materials are the ones who really know what they're doing and create very good materials because uh, often the better somebody is, the more uh, exacting they are in their standards and therefore the more critical they are of their own work. And whereas perhaps somebody else would be less critical because they maybe have lower standards. Who actually owns the material, Therese? Uh, that's a really interesting one. I, I do strongly encourage people wherever they can to, um, to make things Creative Commons because it means that if nothing else, you can reuse it yourself if you then move to another job. But I do know that universities may have a slightly different uh, perception. However, I think universities have an awful lot to gain by, you know, by taking a, an open education resources culture.
I think in terms of time, unless there's any specific questions that we haven't covered that you want to look at, and perhaps specific to accessibility rather than necessarily Creative Commons or licensing, I think it might be time to hand over now. Um, I think it's Therese, uh, sorry, Teresa that I think is doing the final bit, final wrap up. But I Maybe, may yes. be wrong. I can't yes. remember. No, you're right. You're right, Alistair. But thank you for a really exciting and interesting. We've really had a lot of conversation and discussion going on, and I've, I've got the feeling, as often we do get with Open Ed SIG webinars, that this, these conversations will continue. So I'm really glad that people have found each other on Twitter as well to continue them, because actually within the room we've got a lot of very experienced uh, people in, in Open Ed. Um, we've got Open Science, and just looking down this list, we've got an international group of people as well, so that sort of feeds into the discussions around copyright and licensing and the various problems we have there. Um, and it, it, it's a good time to, to actually facilitate these sorts of discussions. Um, and, and it's also been a very, a very uh, contributory discussion that's going on, so lots of sharing as well. So that's, that's great, great to see. And, and Leo with an offer, thank you for that, Leo, as well, who's interested in collecting um, parties around this topic. So yes, let's so let's see if we can, uh, uh, as an open ed SIG, continue to facilitate that um, and to move it on. Um, I just prepared a little sort of, uh, just a few bullet points really from an open ed SIG perspective on the basis of the sorts of things you were talking about, um, Alistair. And, and this was really sort of, this is sort of multiple, and I don't have any particular answers to this, but it's really perhaps a way of continuing the conversation. The first is, is, is around how you've made it very clear through your wonderfully um, paling rainbow as you went through your presentation, just how important these pretty fundamental digital skills really are in, in helping um, access and inclusivity. Um, I happen to be doing a future learn course which I, I put in the text chat earlier at the moment around inclusive practice, which has provided me with some really interesting and useful information actually. Um, uh, but, it, but it needs to be part of professionalism as teachers. Um, our digital capability is important. Um, so it's been a really timely way of reminding us of that and how important those, those skills uh, and capacity building are. Um, the second point really is from an earlier webinar that the Open Ed SIG um, uh, facilitated. And I'll just share a link to that. Um, and that was an event where we talked about the idea of open guilds. Um, this was an idea that was proposed by the co-chair of the Open Ed SIG at the time, um, Terry Lone. What we were looking at there, um, and if you do get a chance, I, I really recommend you have a, a look at that um, webinar, was how Yes, we understand OER are kind of needles in haystacks, and it's wonderful when you find them, but it, sometimes it can be very time consuming finding them in the first place. Um, but if we have communities of practice around our disciplines or around our areas, uh, and we collaborate across sectors, or you know, inside or outside of formal education context as well, we have ways of bringing things together, thanks to the social media tools that we have these days. Um, so the you know the beauty of actually collecting and and valuing uh, the sharing and the conversation around. Um, open educational resources. I think Humbox, uh, which was the University of Southampton, and it's sort of um, a smaller little, little sister as well, Languages Box, um, as, as a methodology uh, for collecting um, OERs was really helpful in fostering that idea of community because it, it had that social aspect as well as just the resource. Um, so I think there are examples of good practice there. And the proposal for guilds really was about, you know, a little bit like an apprenticeship model within um, uh, perhaps a craft where you recognize each other's skills and you learn from each other. Um, so I think it might be worth us uh, revisiting that and, and talking about, you know, whether this is an idea that has legs. 
Um, the third point is, is one of the things we're trying to do at the moment and in the coming year of the Open Ed SIG is to, to try and draw together the many strands of open um, because we've actually got sort of separate open communities. Uh, and we started a little project together just l earlier on this week, actually, trying to visualize the various communities that exist around the word open. Um, we started this little padlet that I'll share here. Uh, and I think it just shows you just how many different communities with, with um, you know, slightly different emphases there are out there, but, uh, but sh they share a value system. Uh, which is about inclusivity, very largely it's a values driven um, uh, a set of priorities. Um, so you've got there the idea of open standards and the, uh, uh, the importance of not allowing people to get locked into certain hardware. Um, the open source movement and just how useful that is to help support um, inclusivity. Um, it's not, I'm very aware that, you know, we tend to sort of bang on sometimes about open source and open source, uh, as Alistair, I think, sort of alluded to, it doesn't answer all of our problems, um, but, it, but it does actually, it is actually built on a model of collaboration and learning from each other. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is just to help um, facilitate that discussion and in a future Open Ed SIG um, webinar we're going to be inviting people from these various communities to, um, to see what we can do to actually identify and, and perhaps communicate more effectively to policymakers that, that value set that, it, that we take so seriously um, and that anybody who, who cares about accessibility and openness takes very seriously. And then finally, and perhaps a bit too philosophically, but <laughs> one of the things that's quite dear to my heart is that, you know, we, we're all very busy people. We have things on our list that we have to achieve. Um, and, and, and that sort of drives us into kind of a mentality that is fairly closed. I have to teach these people this stuff by this time. Um, open practice actually challenges that and makes us think about, you know, what's going to come out of, what are the outcomes of this lesson that actually could be enhanced by being more open and more visible. Um, so um, establishing some way of encouraging people to have that open mindset more often. And I think we tend to see it in sectors as well. We tend to think, you know, why would somebody in HE be interested in something that's come from SE and vice versa? Well, actually, you know, there are conversations there and we can improve and enhance what we do by understanding other people's approaches. So we have in our midst um, one of ALT's Learning Technologists of the Year, um, Daniel Scott here, and I know from sort of doing some work with him on his uh, blog post just how much I learned from his, um, from his practices. And, uh, you know, I think there's so much we can learn from each other. And certainly we've learned a great deal from, from you today, Alistair, and I'm really, really grateful um, for your contribution and for the, the, the um, session that you facilitated here that really has had people thinking and will uh, continue, I'm sure, to think along these lines. Uh, and we'll continue, I hope, to, uh, to engage with, with yourself and with Bob um, on Twitter and uh, cross some of these borders in order to find a fairer way of delivering education. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you to everybody for coming on such a glorious day. And I shall think of you all when I'm out on the water in an hour's time. Beautiful. Well, have a lovely time, and I shall look out for the the uh, subsequent haiku. And uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure that will be excellent. It will uh, come. And thanks <laughs> all for coming. <laughs> yes, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Joe, as well. I can see. Um, it's really, really good to have you there. And I know a lot of you have been engaging in the Open Ed SIG uh, just mail discussions we're having at the moment. Thanks all very much. Um, this has been the Open Ed SIG and Feltag, and I'm going to switch the recording off now.